Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Mario Filiger and today I'm going to make another book review. This one right here, Evergreen Ash, Ecology and Catastrophe in Old Norse Myth and Literature by Christopher Abram. Christopher Abram, a professor at the University of Notre Dame, and he published this book last year, in 2019, a work in which the author proposes to carry out a study inserted in the eco-critical thinking, using the myths and Norse literature confronting the documentation to create a clear structured line of thought concerning eco-criticism. An extensive work, uh, which is not necessarily a new concept, in fact, the author that composed a bibliographic review right in the first chapter, uh, recalling the collection organized by Gillian Overing and uh, Marianne Osborne in the book entitled Landscape of Desire, Partial Stories of the Medieval Scandinavian World, uh, which is uh, a work on spaces and landscapes that approaches this proposal of eco-criticism. And Christopher Abram expresses that book, uh, in this very book, as being the first source in this intellectual line of eco-criticism. A very good book, actually, but I'm not making a review on that one. But it's very good that the author of this book right here um, brought that one, which allows the readers to explore even more concerning eco-criticism. Now, in this book, a good part of the author's considerations come from the comparisons between the materials of the poetic Adda and the Adda in prose. The author seeks to bring to light the duality between nature and society. Fundamental to the understanding of our existence and progression in life in the so-called Anthropocene Epoch which is precisely the period agreed as being the most recent in the history of planet Earth, uh, in which human activities began to have a significant global impact on the climate of the planet and the, the functioning of its ecosystems. Uh, more or less from the beginning of the 18th century onwards with the heavy development of industrialization. So, the author continues to update modern ideas with the help of themes and characters and other figures from the Scandinavian myth. I think it should be taken into account that a good part of this book uses Iceland uh, to analyze mythological documentation, and uh, very important to observe its own cultural conjectures. However, uh, the, the island Iceland <laughs> also serves as a point of abstraction from uh, ecological concerns, which also offers a unique space for its colonization. Iceland is established as a community by immigrants from Northern Europe in the middle of the 9th century, as you know it, and um, its new inhabitants were face to face with new challenges, several new challenges, and, and a, a very remarkable task, actually, which is to resignify everything. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a word in English, resignify, but were I Shakespeare, I would definitely make that an official word. But the point here is that these Scandinavian immigrants not only had to give an entire new meaning, resignify everything, so an entire new meaning to their entire new space, but also new meanings and conceptions to the entire non-human community living in this new landscape all around them, including, of course, animals and plants, uh, as well as the supernatural community of local spirits. So this is very important to take in mind because, uh, as I've said a couple of times in, in, in some of my videos in this channel, a great part of the mythological and religious elements of the pre-Christian Scandinavians, of the so-called Viking period, was related to the geographical environment in which they lived, or even explained by it. Certainly, it was also closely linked to the legal, political and economic structures of the late Iron Age and early medieval Nordic society. But the great majority, a great portion of the Norse myths, 
concern the natural environment in which these people live in. It's not only about animistic perceptions or, or surviving animistic perceptions, but also the great variety of several belief systems in pre-Christian Scandinavia that were concerned with practical cultic and ceremonial activity in relation to the surroundings people lived in and a great contact with the natural space, the natural environment from which they depended very much on and the need to be in contact with several spiritual entities or supernatural entities, if you will, of the land to create a symbiotic relationship with such entities or with such non-human persons for the benefit of their own lives. So the Norse myths also contain a development, a great development of several centuries of religious and spiritual approaches towards the environment, the natural environment. So Scandinavian immigrants, upon arriving to Iceland, a completely new natural environment, it's almost a start from zero, and the Scandinavian myths changed quite a lot in Iceland and from that moment, moment onwards. <laughs> and with the contact with other lands, of course, precisely due to the need to be in contact and understand the, the, the new environments. So it's very important to always take this into consideration. The evolution of myth, the evolution of mythology in general, not only based in the adoption of new religious understandings and cultural syncretisms, but also with the real close contact with different natural environments. It's really very important to focus on the Icelandic context to understand the development of Norse myths. The medieval Icelandic colonization brought serious environmental impacts, among which uh, the Perhaps the one that deserves greater emphasis in this context, the Icelandic context, is precisely the cutting down of native trees in Iceland. An aggressive action that permanently altered the entire landscape. So it is curious that the title of this book, the title the author chose, uh, includes ash in relation to Yggdrasil, probably. Yggdrasil is constantly referred to as an ash tree, as you know it. Although there were mis mistranslations and uh, in fact Yggdrasil uh, was most likely possibly a yew tree. But being ash or yew, it matters little in relation to Iceland because those are trees that never grew in Iceland. They, they are not native to Iceland. So what impact did this have on the mentality of Scandinavian immigrants when faced with a, a new reality, a new landscape that does not show, for instance, a figure or motif as a central element of Norse mythology, which is Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil being a specific tree species that is not native to Iceland. So what types of attitudes did Icelanders have around this absence of religious and even spiritual motif? So this is one of the ideas and an important feeling for the notion of catastrophe among Icelanders as they developed new mythological concepts and new perceptions of the supernatural when face to face with new challenges and completely new landscapes, natural environments. An idea that the author will develop throughout this entire book. So the first chapter entitled Ecocriticism and Old Norse is a theoretical and methodological overview of the proposal that the author wants to express, as well as the objectives. It is important to note that the bibli bi bibliography used uh, in this book to create this work is very solid and up-to-date, including recent projects in mythology in which space and environmental concerns occupy a relatively important portion of its conceptions. This is one of the reasons why I actually like this work quite a lot, because the author was concerned with being uh, updated and not continuing to rely on earlier works, especially those made in the first half, or rather in the, in the 19th century and the, first, and the first half of the 20th century, which were highly romanticized and completely full of political ideologies that had a considerable negative impact, even to this day, on the studies and comprehension of Norse myths and um, pre-Christian Scandinavian cultures in general. So, there are some important points here that the author makes that can certainly help scholars and non-scholars, obviously, 
as well, <laughs> people concerned with environmental issues. For example, the perspective of analyzing a non-Christian belief system and the absence at times of nature as a cosmological entity, and of course the case of animism, among other things. I'm not going to review each chapter, don't worry, but there are several points of interest that I would like to mention. As an example, the examination of the myth of creation and the cosmic structures created by the gods, of which conceptions of the world are revealed by the confrontation between society and nature. The author presents a clear understanding of the separation between human society and the natural world, uh, which, he, uh, which is really something that starts to happen or, or progressively in Scandinavia um, already during the Bronze Age and, of course, the Iron Age, which is something a little bit more perceptible in the archaeological context before the written sources. And there is this abandonment progressively of more animistic concepts. We began to see the attempt to separate the human world from the supernatural. The separation from the world where we humans live from those worlds or realms in which the gods live or, or the supernatural. And the author associates this with a violent delimitation of spaces which can be seen in, in the language itself, at least in Old Norse language, the separation of spaces between Gardr, uh, while the other space outside in a broader panorama, of outside the human community or the, the society of, of human persons, is referred to as Eimbre. And the, the mythology reaches a point where there must never be a crossing of erected borders or limits, which in many occasions always represents safety, but also taboos within the Norse society, and avoid having contact with what lies beyond the civilized world and the known spaces, right? So this is a very important, um, it's very important to reflect upon because in the Norse mentality, uh, the abandonment of the natural space and contact with nature is not exclusively due to the arrival of Christianity, but also due to the fact that any society anywhere in the world has this tendency to make a clear separation between nature and the world of man as soon as a society begins to live a more sedentary life and centered in, the, in that space of existence. So the author presents very curious analysis between the myths and the catastrophe present in, in the world in our current time and the ecological impact due to the careless actions of humanity and in ignoring those same actions. For instance, as an example, Loke as a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> the author comes to the conclusion that the gods, the Heisir, are aware of their actions and possible consequences. And the agents of destruction cannot be controlled, even though there is an attempt by the gods themselves to ignore or limit these agents of destruction to other realms, to other spaces, such as Loki, Hel, uh, Jormungandr, and Fenrir. We also make the same mistakes in our own time. We believe that there will be a tomorrow, as before, as it has always been, and that we can ignore our own agents of destruction. There is no escape when Loki's offsprings offspring, <laughs> uh, the world serpent, uh, the wolf Fenrir and Hell revolt and take revenge due to the gods' actions, careless actions, and ignoring the growing problems and the mistreatment of entities of the world. So the Haesir have failed and the encounter with Ragnarok is inevitable. They must face the consequences of their own actions, which will have a greater impact due to ignoring the impact that the actions of the gods themselves were provoking. The author is searching for the elementary concepts of uh, green mythology, if you take my meaning, in Scandinavian accounts. Christopher Abram is clear in his conclusions. The pagan cults at some point were not centered on the earth anymore. The gods depended too much on artificial structures and 
uh, hierarchical ontologies based on the subjugation of others, the subjugation of the giants in the in the case of Norse mythology, the, the Jotnar uh, especially, and of their women in particular. However, unable to sustain a green perspective for Norse myths, Christopher Abram questions the reasons for the Hasir's failure in their endeavors against the cosmic cataclysm. And so several important lessons are expressed from uh, the negative examples surrounding eco ecological criticism. So this book contains important questions that can help, really, uh, to reflect on the human impact on the climate, on the natural environment, using Norse myths as a basis for comparison but also to reflect on the impact humans have upon other humans and non-humans as well. It is also a good book to see Norse mythology from another perspective, another completely different point of view, and to include these ideas in a growing global panorama and not to continue trying to close the culture and keep it only within a specific group of people, otherwise it will be lost. More and more we live in a globalized world and we are all in contact with each other. It has always been like this throughout history. A constant attempt to be in contact with the world and its inhabitants. We are in this together. Shutting and closing away our minds from knowledge and the, the sharing of ideas and concepts and culture, we are making the same mistake as the Haysir did ignoring and postponing the consequences of our negative actions and the impact that this has on others. We don't live in a bubble where each individual is self-centered. No matter how many people try to do this, that's not the reality we live in right now. And sooner or later, the consequences of our actions will be made clear and it can be a, a catastrophe if we have the same attitudes as the haze here and simply ignore it until it is too late. The eco-critical approach in these contexts of mythology must also be evaluated. Of course, it does not offer an ultimate answer for or to the problems of our time, but it gives a point of reflection to the several problems, fears and doubts of a global capitalist society in an escalating crisis. The duality of nature versus society, a price we all must pay, just as the same way the characters and figures and gods of Norse mythology had, also, had to pay also. So, we can have the same attitudes as the Haysir or not, to believe that tomorrow will be like yesterday, even though we know Ragnarok will come, it is inevitable. The Haysir erected great walls that separated them from beings oppressed by the gods themselves, but that great wall will fall eventually and all the exploited resources and structures will be completely useless. Now, should we really act like the Haysir? persist on error and ignore our actions and the growing catastrophe, or will our path be different and try to at least mitigate the inevitable Ragnarok? It's a really interesting book, worth the try, worth the reading. <laughs> Alright, my dear friends, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, book review on this book. Really, you should try this one. It's it's really good and a completely different perspective. So, once again, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Tak for